Chargers. Touchdown, UCLA. With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. We are back on the airwaves of the mightier 1090. What's going on, Los Angeles? What's going on, San Diego, Orange County, Santa Barbara, all across the Southland? I am your host, Ryan Dyrud, of this beautiful establishment, the LA Football Show, on the LA Football Network, the Believe Podcast Network, and as mentioned, live right now on AM, the mightier 1090. How's everyone doing out there? It's a beautiful, beautiful Friday here in the Southland. The heat's getting back up there. I did enjoy that uh, nice and cool fall weather, which is weird to say. September is always like the hottest month since I've moved here over, what, 13 plus years ago. Um, but anyway, we had a nice cool weather, but now it's the heat coming back, which is okay. Just in time for some college football games, right? Uh, but yeah, hope everyone's doing well. Hit me up on Twitter at Ryan Dyrud, L-A-F-B. Love to get your thoughts. Hit up our main account at LAFB Network. You can find all of our great work there, all of our digital content. We're on YouTube at LAFB Network. LAFBnetwork.com is the website. Anything you want for your Los Angeles football teams, Rams, Chargers, Trojans, Bruins. We're adding more high school content as well. It's going to be found right there. So check it out. Got a great show for you today on this Friday afternoon or evening. Uh, I'm going to be joined again every week by the great Frosty Rucker, USC legend. Those who don't know Frosty Rucker, look him up. He was a USC legend, two-time national champion, and played 13 years in the NFL. That's no easy feat. So he's going to join me at the you know this first segment here to talk about this new uh, and improved USC team as they take on the San Jose State Spartans in their home opener, their season opener. Uh, so we'll get into that. Plus, a little bit of a, a Rams and Chargers cut talk. If you want to get more in depth, I did an episode earlier in the week, really breaking down all of these uh, transactions that the Rams and Chargers made. Um, so that'll give you more in depth. But we just talk about Frosty's experience. You know, he was in the league. What were those conversations like getting cut? What was it like seeing guys you were in training camp with, giving your blood, sweat, and tears, and then seeing them get released by the team? So it's a really good behind the curtains scene. So let's go ahead. You know. He's getting situated, but let's get Frosty in here right now to really break this down. All right, joining me again on the LA Football Show on the airwaves of the mightier 1090, my friend, Frosty Rucker, two-time national champ at USC, 13-year NFL vet. We're going to talk some of these cuts and also preview this Trojans and San Jose State Spartans game. Frost, what's up, man? How you doing? Man, I'm good. I mean, you make it sound like I've been missing. I'm back, man. You're back for good. I know. I'm I know. back. You're back for good. I, I think I've, Ryan. I'm just holding on. I, I'm holding on hope that it's for real. I'm here, man. <laughs> I'm here, man. But I'm feeling good, man. Uh, LA is sunny. It was a little gloomy this morning, but you know how it is. Uh, the yeah. sun's shining, frosty smiling. What's up, good man? What's up, Ryan? That's good. No, I'm good. And yeah, we have like June gloom in, uh, I guess, now September, but it's been weird this last week. It's been kind of nice, though, from the heat. It's been a nice break. Yeah, it was getting hot out here. Now it's starting to cool down. But, you know, in the evening, it's starting to get more fall like. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, football it's... weather, right? It's football weather. I know. I'm ready. Do you have like a, a go to? I mean, you've only been retired, what, going on your third year, but do you have like a go to meal you make for, for football games now? Well, my coach, Robert Williams, my first football coach, he told me to always eat spaghetti the night before the game because of the carbs. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand what carbs were when I was seven, eight, nine, but he <laughs> told me to eat spaghetti. And that was kind of the ritual that I did all through uh, high school, college, and um, on to professional. I always had a bowl of um, some type of pasta. Yeah. I'm saying I'm, I'm Italian, so that was natural anyway. But yeah, Ooh. when I played sports, hockey, football, it was always carb up with the, uh, with the spaghetti. But now that I'm a fan in the fall weather, I'm all about, you know, making homemade bowl of chili. Ooh. All about that chili before game day. I love chili, and especially you put it on the Frito chips, but that's yeah. another story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can get at that another time. Yeah, uh, we have a food show. Yeah, there you go. Frosty's food. Um, but yeah, I want to get your take on some of these, not necessarily specific roster cuts, but we just had the roster cut down day in the NFL on Tuesday. A, um, you know, a tough day for a lot of players and also a dream come true for a lot of players that make it through. And for a lot of these guys too, it doesn't mean the journey ends, 
but you know, the rosters get down to 53 players from, I think they started at 90 and they go down to 85 and they go into 80 and then they make the big cut to 53 now with the new collective bargaining agreement. But, um, walk us through, uh, me and everyone else as a fan, just what that process is like. I think we talked off air. You have been cut one time, still had a 13 year career. So obviously you made it work, but yeah. what's that feel like? And then what's it also just feel like when you see like friends of yours that go through the grind and then end up waking up, not being on the team no more. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the most uh, high and low day, which is uh, that Tuesday um, of the football season, you know, like you just alluded to. You're, you're working hard with these guys all through spring. Well, that was when before COVID. Mm-hmm. And then you get to training camp and, you know, you're, you you bond these uh, these friendships and, you know, this trust, you know, going through preseason games and being out there battling with guys, seeing guys battle through injuries. And, you know, when they don't get the – the right shake of it. It just, it's unfortunate. You know, I've been on the, the side of making the team every time I competed. Mm-hmm. Um, the one time I was released was in the off season. So um, I like to say, I, you know, I gave it my best shot every time and I, you know, I was rewarded for that, but that doesn't say the guys that got cut, it's over um, mm-hmm. many guys. That's just the beginning of how it really starts. That's where, you know, your backs against the wall and you know how many things guys go through just to get to that point. And now it's really against the wall. It's a really do or die if you really want to do this. And I got a lot of guys, the cream rises to the top. They get on a practice squad somewhere. Uh, They get busy in practice. Uh, Someone goes down or they just get busy and they just look great on tape, you know, because all the teams out there are watching the tape all through the preseason. And, you know, the the, the one thing that I learned uh, playing a long time with the scouts say is that they're always looking for if a guy can make that team better. So they got their eyes on guys waiting through the preseason, see how they shake down. And um, if they want the guy, they're going to go get him. Yeah. And, you know, we specifically one that I talked about at the beginning of the week, the probably biggest surprise cut for our LA teams yeah. was on the chargers and Tyrone Johnson, who was a, a big focal point. We talked about a lot on the show last year, Frosty, yeah. big focal point of the offense, the deep ball that opened things up for Justin Herbert was surprisingly released, but he immediately snatched up by Jacksonville and he may end up being their like wide receiver number two over there. Yeah, and it's a great look for him. Obviously, you, like I, I said earlier, you, you make friends and you think uh, you've done everything you can for uh, organization and you wouldn't be in that position. But it, it's the rule of, of law of what it is. It's, it's the NFL. Uh, you get released and he'll make the most out of this situation. And I really think the Chargers did that because they got our, our good friend Jared Cook over there that is now a new threat. And mm-hmm. you know, hopefully I'm not spilling any beans, but he knows how to get open. Yeah. 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 You know, 17 touchdowns over his last two years or so. So a definite red zone threat. Uh, and, you know, they kept a guy like Jalen Guyton, who's similar in the sense that he can stretch the field. But uh, one other guy that, you know, I mentioned last week, and we kind of talked a little bit, Eric Banks, who was yeah. been on the Rams last year, started a lot, or not started, but played or dressed in a lot of games was released by the Rams, but because Brandon Staley was his former coach ends up getting picked up by the chargers. So now he doesn't even have to move most likely unless he doesn't want to make the longer commute down to Orange County. Did you ever see, um, I'm sure you did, but did you ever see friends of yours get cut, but then because of like past coaching relationships, just get snatched up because they know someone in the building. Well, absolutely. It helps to have a familiar face in the building that can vouch for you outside of a scout or someone that scouted you coming out of college or whatnot. But mm-hmm. when you have an ally out there, a coach that, you know, like this guy will do anything, this guy will play special teams. You know, I'd rather give him a shot than someone that we all don't know and have a relationship with. So that's why I always tell these younger guys nowadays, it's like you have to make those uh, relationship with these coaches because they get put in positions as well as you do. And if you can vouch for them, they can vouch for you in certain mm-hmm. things. So, uh, it always happens. Um, that's how the coaching carousel goes too. You know, you could be a head coach and then a wide receiver the next year just because you've been on someone's staff. They love your work ethic, and they would love to have you. The same that goes for the athlete. You got to make these relationships. Yeah. Well, and that's I think we see it all the time when obviously all world talent is different. Like superstar, you're always gonna be on a team. But if you're that that fringe guy, but you're a personable guy coaches like you teammates love you they want you in the locker room but you're a little worse than maybe another guy but not a lot of people like them you're probably gonna make the team or someone's gonna come calling for you as opposed to the guy that might be a little better on the field but no one wants to be around him. yeah and sometimes people rather not deal with the headache and they want the guys that are the people's champ in the locker room that can rally the troops and hold court when they needs to in the locker room and the frosty uh, ruckers yeah I'm, I'm one of those guys not a superstar guy but i'm gonna give you everything i got and i'm gonna give you some numbers out there you know, I'm going to stay active. 
There so you, when you get guys like that that are willing to really gel your team and keep it together. That's a lot of value. And um, a lot of our guys are going to get put in that position. And I, I'm just excited. Football's here, man. You know, yeah. I love talking about some real active things. I love talking about, you know, D-Day. Uh, and I love talking about, you know, the first game coming up, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's time. Yeah. Can't wait. And do want to give a shout out to all the UCLA Bruins and USC Trojans that were drafted this year, all making respected teams, some on the practice squad, but all are on teams. Uh, both Oso Digizua and Dimitri Felton at UCLA are on their active rosters. And then you have uh, Hufunga up in San Francisco, who had a great camp at a safety. Yeah. And we, he may get some starting reps, I'm hearing. Like, he's looked phenomenal up there. Yeah. He's a hell of a player, man. They took yeah. him for a reason. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to watch him blossom. Well, I loved it because we talked a lot when covering him at, at USC last year about, you know, his game speed is something different. Like, everyone talks about measurables and combine and all that. And he, he ran like a four, six for, for safety. He isn't blowing anyone away, but we'd be like, dude, this guy can flat out play and seeing all the reports. Cause I, you know, I try to keep close to the vest, especially since I cover the Rams or we right. cover the Rams seeing what the Niners beat writers are saying, like, man, this guy just looks so much faster on tape than what his measurable are. So I'm like, yeah, if you listen to the like football show, we've been telling you that yeah, <laughs> the dude can play. I mean, we're the cheat codes, man. We, we know all these guys like the, the back of our hand. And again, it's just another guy that's a flat out football player. Yeah. You can't coach that stuff. You can help them in the offseason running and stuff like that. But once the ball's in the air and the receivers are running routes and he knows where to be, you can play fast. That is a testament to how smart he is, right? Mm -hmm. The guy watching him play at USC takes a lot of chances. He's trying to make the play. It's mm -hmm. a great thing, you know, because you want to get that aggression and then you want to be able to have it coached. Yeah, right? exactly. So I'm sure he's going to have a heck of a career. Yeah, absolutely. And and the last one we'll say, and then we'll we'll move on. Or I got one more for you about just getting cut, and then we'll move on to the this Trojans preview. But uh, Amon Ross St. Brown also heard had a phenomenal camp for the Lions. He may end up being their wide receiver one here in a very short time where their the expectations weren't as high. We all knew how good he was, but it's good to see you know the Orange County kid, uh, the local guy that goes to USC and then ends up hopefully having a really good NFL career for a uh, Detroit Lions team. Yeah, absolutely, and he has a, a huge opportunity to be in that offense with their new quarterback coming from L.A. He mm -hmm. has some to prove, right? So now you you got two hungry cats out there that are going to feed off each other. Uh, I like Brown. I think this is his time to really shine. He had a phenomenal camp, like you said. Uh, he competed in all the preseason games, which is a great thing to see, and it's time for him to light it up. You know, he was always the guy on the roster that was – Obviously talented at USC, mm -hmm. but there's always someone else that we we're complimenting him with. Now it's his time to, you know, cream rises to the top and step aside and say, let me do this. And now it's the big boy time. You know, this is your career. And when you touch the ball, you got to score. And that's one thing he does. He's a shifty guy. He's going to be in mm -hmm. great shape. He's going to keep his body going. And um, another guy that's going to be on the watch for uh, Detroit this year. Yeah, absolutely. Modern day product from right here in Orange County. So yeah, I didn't um, want to say it. I, I'm a testing guy. I didn't want to say much. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> uh, you know, there's some good testing guys around, you yeah. being one of them. But uh, so last thing before we preview this, uh, just to kind of look behind the curtain, you talked about how you were released from a team in the offseason, not actually on cut day. But right. now that Hard Knocks is out there, as fans, we can kind of see that awkward process. Like for some guys, it's super quick. Some guys, they actually keep the film rolling, and you can see not really an argument, but like a back and forth. What is it actually like? Is it like a super awkward thing or is it kind of just like, hey, we're releasing you? Okay, thanks for that. They released, me, they released me on the phone. You know? Oh, okay. I, yeah, and I actually went in and met with the coach and he was telling me how excited he was to be able to work with me. He heard a lot of great things around how I was a leader and how I kept guys going when we had uh, not had the best of season my first year in Cleveland. And then he did the honors of calling me and not letting anyone else call to oh, tell me. At least. I know we just met. This isn't really my call, but I have to make this phone call and we're going to release you. And I was in shock because I had just left the facility. <laughs> that was the, that was the craziest thing. I just left the facility working out, right? Yeah. In the off season after we won, what, five games that year? So, yeah. hey, I left. And you had just signed a contract with them, haven't you? With Cleveland? Yeah, the year before, a five year deal. So I left and they were at the Cleveland Browns all the way until probably last year or now. They're <laughs> a really good football team. Yeah. They're a, a different Cleveland Browns, I guess. We can yeah. finally start saying. Um, well, yeah, well, hey, you ended up going on having a great career with Arizona and then finishing it off with then the Oakland Raiders. So I think it all worked out. And I got to play versus them twice, and that was great too. There you and go. And I beat them twice. So Love it. it all worked out. 
redemption. Redemption is sweet. Every time um, I went out there, I, I, that's exactly how I took it. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, uh, let's wrap up with this, with this USC Trojan uh, preview as they host San Jose State. First game of the year. You know, dude, I'm hyped. Like, I'm excited to see this team. We talked last week, kind of our expectations for the season and what we hope this team can accomplish and what we think they can do and how far they can go. Um, but this first week, you know, a lot of people were overlooking it because obviously it's a, you know, a Mountain West school, but they did win the Mountain West last season. They did have a game last week, granted against Southern uh, Utah, but they won like 45 to 14, like offense was clicking. So you still got to take that into account. Um, yeah. What are your expectations for this game? Like does SC need to come out and make a statement or are you just like, you know, it's the first game. Let's just, you know, get the oil oh, exactly. going in the joints or do they need to make a statement? Statement. SC is supposed to be that good. You know, when you watch social media this whole offseason, you see the moves they make to see how exciting the coaches are, the energy. I want a dominant game. This is a Mountain West team playing versus a Pac-12 team, the team that should have hopes of going to a playoffs this year and making some real noise. They have every piece of the puzzle. They have guys at every position that are ready to step up and play. Um, great team in Mountain West. They should compete. But I would say that should be for a quarter, maybe a quarter and a half. And then I would love to see uh, the USC run game really get established. I would love to see some pitch and catch by Slovis, you know, but I really want to see some things uh, that I wanted to see change from last year. Special teams. I want to see how they grow. Uh, like I said, running the game, running the ball and, and how they defend on the, in the deep end. So uh, they got some guys that, you know, in the safety position, they got drafted. People are stepping up. Mm -hmm. You know, their D-line, O-line should be very solid. They had a lot of camp battles, and we'll see how that, that first roster comes out there on Saturday. Yeah. I just want to see them get off to a, a hot start because last year that seemed to be the trend is just getting off to slow starts and then finishing strong, which was, you know, obviously good, finishing the regular season undefeated. Right. But I know it's the first game of the year, but, you know, they've been practicing. There wasn't – I mean, there's obviously COVID protocols, but they weren't not having practices. They had a full fall camp, right. full week of practices. Uh, we had our beat writer out there just yesterday checking in on them and, you know, said things were looking good and smooth. And so I just want to see them get off to a hot start. Now, I know you've dabbled a little bit with bet online, a little, little betting last year. Yeah, right now, the uh, the Trojans are 14 point favorites and the over under is set at 59. Trojans better. They got to win by more than 14, right? In this one. Yeah, I believe so. I think they rain and uh, they make it rain in the second half. I think it's going to be a game that multiple people uh, get to play. And I think we'll finally see it. Uh, Jackson Dart. There you go. I, I really think we'll get, we'll see him and see what the dynamic he brings to the table. Cause I think that's going to be the toughest thing for uh, the Trojans this year is that, that, that QB battle all season. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a guy right on your heels, ready to play, add into the new dimension to the game, which he can run the ball and uh, make plays uh, versus a guy that is, arguably a uh, great statistical quarterback at USC mm -hmm. making uh, it do with that offense. He's moving the ball and he wins games, tight games. So uh, I'll love to see how this plays out. And I think this first game of the season, we may be seeing two quarterbacks. Yeah. Love that. Hopefully because they're up by 21, 28, 35 plus points. Yeah. We can see the freshmen get in there and, and get some reps, which would be great. So um, I agree with you. I think, I think the Trojans, you know, I'm going to be, I don't want to sound like a homer, but I think they put up 42 plus points in this one and uh, hold uh, San Jose State to under 20, so getting over that 14-point threshold. Um, but should be a good one. I'm excited to finally see fans back in the Cauley. Uh, we'll see how – I, I wonder how – because obviously it's not a big-time matchup, but I wonder how packed the stadium will be. you think they'll get at least half full? Yeah. Um, from what I hear, they're going to let it rip and pull the Band-Aid off and let guys, everyone get in there and, and enjoy, but I think they're not doing tailgating. So I don't know if that neglects mm -hmm. I'm going because a lot of people like to tailgate. Some people you know, go just to tailgate and make it in by halftime. <laughs> they want to eat their chili at the stadium, right? That's right. That's right. Frosty's food is going to be set up there, but not this week, I guess. So, well, not this year, but we're going to get a booth, though. So That's right. That's right. Better, but next best case scenario. So, all right. Well, Frost and I both like the Trojans this one. It uh, should be a good game, though. Tune in on Saturday at 2 p.m. on the Pac-12 Network, and uh, we'll have all the coverage for you next week on recapping that and then previewing week two. So, Frost, my man, appreciate you as always. Thanks for all the insight on you know cut day on this Trojans team and looking forward to uh, doing this Trojans huddle all season long. Absolutely. I'm here, man. Holla. All right, man. Take care. And there he goes, the great Frosty Rucker. First segment brought to you, as always, by Brewery X. My friends at Brewery X, located in Anaheim on the La Palma Beer Trail, right near Honda Center and Angel Stadium. 30 beers on tap. 
10 hard seltzers. You can find them in Trader Joe's. Total Wine, BevMo. Great friends, great family, great beer, great for football Sundays. Check out my friends at Brewery X. With that said, we're going to take a quick break. Come back to you at the bottom of the hour for some more L.A. football talk. What's up, L.A. football fans, and welcome back to the L.A. football show. You are listening live on the Mightier 1090, also on the L.A. football network. If we are live on YouTube or if you're listening on every podcast platform, Apple, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, all of them. What is there, like hundreds now? We are everywhere. You listen to podcasts. Just look up the L.A. football podcast to listen to us anytime. But every Friday at 5, you can find us on AM 1090. Turn that dial there, and you'll hear the great sounds of L.A. football. So thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. Love what we're doing so far. Football season is finally upon us. Wrapped up a great segment with Frosty Rucker about uh, this Trojans game, and now we're going to get into a little UCLA because they host the LSU Tigers at the Rose Bowl tomorrow, 5.30 p.m. kickoff. I will be there, present, live at the Rose Bowl. Cannot wait. Big Pac-12 SEC matchup. See how this UCLA team looks, because after a huge dominant performance last week against Hawaii, we'll be able to gauge a little better this week against LSU, who had a down year last year, but was a national champion just two years ago. Ed Ogeron's Kojo, Kojo, Kojo returns to L.A. I know against a different team, not USC, but still back in the Southland. So it'll be good to see Coach O on the sidelines. Uh, for this segment, I am going to be joined by Preston Guy. He covers the LSU Tigers for TigerBait.com. So he can give us a little insight about this Tigers team. So let's w- join him in. Let's get him in here right now. And uh, let's get into this game and, and see how this UCLA team matches up with LSU. All right, LA football fans, UCLA football fans got a big game this week. Non-conference, but probably the biggest of the season, or at least on the barometer to see how this UCLA team can actually be after a big blowout win last week against Hawaii. Uh, they welcome LSU, the former national championship champions from two years ago, to the Rose Bowl. And to jump on with me to really give us some good insight to this Tigers team and what we can expect is a uh, pressing guy who's the beat writer for TigerBait.com. So he does great work over there. You can find him at pguy underscore 77 on Twitter. Preston, what's going on, my man? How you doing? Hey, man. How's it going? Thanks for having me today. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. First, before we even get rolling, man, how how are you and your community holding up? I mean, you're in the city. Obviously, hurricane season is upon us. We all know what's going on down there. So how are you guys and your safety and and how's that been going on? Well, the good news is, is that you know, this, it seems like most people in this area are safe. I do know areas a little further south of Baton Rouge have been hit pretty hard. However, most people evacuated. I haven't heard of too many deaths or injuries. Um, and I don't know anybody personally who suffered any serious damage. Most people in the LSU media circles tends to be the, the case, too. Uh, so we're very thankful not to have any serious damage. Uh, Right now, we're just trying to rebuild a lot of our power lines. A lot of people are without water and power, and heat index is is in the hundreds right now. So mm. a little bit of safety concerns, but you know these these people in South Louisiana were really resilient and uh, built to survive situations like this. And I can tell you, we are all looking forward to a much needed distraction come Saturday. Oh man, I can't even imagine. Yeah, it's. You know, we're, we're all over here in L.A. praying for everyone down there, and it's, you know, never a good situation. But, yeah, you're right. You guys are resilient. You know, you've been through it before, unfortunately. Um, and I just got to say I appreciate, you know, I, I almost didn't want to hit you up because I'm like, all right, they're going through all this stuff. This guy doesn't want to jump on with me and talk football. But I did, and I'm glad I did. And thank you for uh, taking the time and taking, hopefully, a distraction to uh, some talk from talk some ball with me. Sure, no problem. So let's just get into it. So for fans that out here that probably don't know a lot about LSU, we can keep it super simple. Two years ago, you know, record breaking season, you know, we know what Joe Burrow did national champions. You lose basically the entire team, the entire coaching staff. Uh, and you're in rebuild mode last year, kind of a down year, disappointing year, which kind of was to be expected with all you lost. So what do we expect this year? Is this going to be an LSU team more similar to 2019 Is it going to be a little better than last year? What's kind of the expectation down there in Baton Rouge with this LSU team? Yeah, you can definitely expect somewhere in the middle. I know that's not saying much because last year was probably one of LSU's worst teams of the last 20 years. And then the year before was arguably the best team in all college football history. 
So it's a safe guess to say somewhere in the middle. Um, to kind of just put my thumb on it, I mean, this team has a lot of talent. I mean, the last three recruiting classes have all been in the top five recruiting rankings. Mm. Uh, and lots of guys going. I mean, you look, there's five-star and four-star players littered all over the field. Um Big question marks are just going to be those two coordinators who haven't, you know, they're both new and both haven't called a play. Um, they are both uh, protégés of the championship coordinators for that 2019 run. Uh, both, uh, you know, uh, Durante Jones, defensive coordinator, was highly recommended by Dave Aranda. Jake Pete's highly recommended by uh, of course, LSU's Joe Brady, who wasn't the coordinator, but mm-hmm. he was more of the mastermind behind that LSU offense. So they're both expected to be good, but we've never seen them call plays, and that will be the key to LSU season. I think it'll be a good season for LSU to kind of spoil my my prediction I'll be giving soon enough. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go LSU should be about a 10-2 and two team this year. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's... That's good. Good by Pac-12 standards for sure. <laughs> we can say that much. Uh, SEC maybe not as much, but I think that's a good turnaround from last year. Who are some players? And this is your first game of the year. Uh, USCLA, as I alluded to, played last week and you know looked great. By you know the expectations for this team this year are you know this is make or break year for Chip Kelly, and if this team can actually you know move forward back to where they were during the Terry Donahue days. And last week they looked apart. Granted, it was against you know a, a much lesser opponent in Hawaii, so this will be a better barometer this week. But who are some players on this LSU team now that UCLA fans should be watching for or worried about, or guys that can really be wow guys on Saturdays? Do they have you know the next Jamar Chase, the next Joe Burrow? Who are the guys that we should be looking for yeah. in this matchup? Yeah, so I'll start on the offensive side of the ball. Um, Max Johnson it will be LSU's quarterback. Uh, he started the last two games for LSU last year. Of course, LSU had injuries and all sorts of things going on last year, opt-outs. Well, Max Johnson inherited an absolute mess of a roster with guys opting out left to right, true mm-hmm. freshmen scattered everywhere you look. I mean, the team was just missing everything. Well, he came in and played very well and led LSU to beat uh, top 10 team on the road in Florida and then won a shootout against Ole Miss. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is the son of Super Bowl winning quarterback Brad Johnson. So above the shoulders, it's kind of just unfair comparing him to other young players. He just plays exceptionally well. Um, he, he is a very smart, very uh, risk averse quarterback. Uh, last year he did. He, I mean, he he had some, you know, some some 300 yard games. He, he looked very nice, and uh, you know, had had I think he had 12 touchdowns, including rushing, to only one interception. So I expect him to be a very good player. He was going to battle out with fifth year senior quarterback Miles Brennan, who was the starter at the beginning of last year, taking over for Joe Burrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, Miles Brennan. Uh, suffered an injury last year in the third game of the year after not winning very many games. He went one and two as a starter. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, before the season, he broke his arm in a freak fishing accident. So that's your quarterback to watch out. The superstar uh, of this offense I'm expecting to be Keishon Butte. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't realize he broke the single-game SEC receiving yard record last year against Ole Miss as a true freshman. So mm-hmm. he had three hundred. The only SEC player ever to have a three hundred yard receiving game. He was all over the place. Five star guy. Uh, really busted onto the scene last year when Max Johnson took over and guys like Terrace Marshall opted out for the rest of the year. He really just took over. Um, so those are your two guys on offense. You should expect to be kind of your star players. Um, course running back will be a committee group for lsu uh, and i don't expect any of those guys to really take the reins but you got a lot of good players defensively your superstars you're looking for lsu i think lsu has the best corner tandem in the country of course lsu's defensive backfield was historically bad last year under mm-hmm. bo pelini and for a lot of reasons i will tell people lsu was more disproportionately hurt by the covid year than any other team in the country i could spend an hour telling you why but they just had to replace everybody (laughs) with new coaches and all that good stuff and it it just was an absolute nightmare to try to you know break in new guys but um these two players i'm expecting to be the best corner tandem and the most improved unit in the country that's eli ricks 
and Derek Stingley Jr. Both mm-hmm. were the number one corner in the country for the recruiting class. Derek Stingley Jr. was, of course, an All-American as a freshman during that championship run. Last year, he battled some injuries, missed some games, and you know tried to play hard a few times. And uh, he he was good when he played, but you know he he wasn't quite as elite. Those two guys are going to make it very hard to pass on this defense. Just having two absolute lockdown corners, and of course, Eli Ricks was. Mr. Everything as a freshman, lots of uh, pick sixes, just uh, absolutely uh, great player as a true freshman. So those are going to be two guys to keep a big eye out for. You know, that's a great uh, segue, I guess, into what I was going to say. And I think that's, uh, I don't know if that should be exciting for Bruins fans here or fearful, but why I think this matchup can actually be closer than many people probably think, just seeing a UCLA versus an SEC team. Um, I don't know how closely you follow the Bruins. I'm sure you've done your research, obviously, now playing them this week but this offense is going to you know go through the running game and what they were able to do last week against Hawaii and you know Zach Charbonnet the transfer who just had a monster had like six carries and over 100 yards and three touchdowns uh was just a wrecking ball out there and and Britton Brown and and the the one-two punch they can do there how is LSU's rush defense because I think in order for UCLA to win this game they have to run the ball well and kind of keep the ball out of Dorian Thompson Robinson's hands who is known to you know, give turnovers, give the ball away, throw interceptions. Yeah. And UCLA does not want to do that. They want, you know, if they can, you know, uh, not have DTR throw more than 20 times this game, they can rush the ball 30, 35, 40 plus. I think this game can actually be close and will be a good competition. So how's LSU's rush defense? Cause that or run defense, excuse me. Cause I think that'll be the big thing to watch for in this one. Yeah, no. And I absolutely agree with you that UCLA does match up well with this LSU team. What a funny thing to say. I've right? been saying this 10 years ago that <laughs> a Chip Kelly Pac-12 team is going to be a ground and pound running attack uh, coming against an LSU team that is in the SEC and has a very mm-hmm. modern offense and modern defense yeah. to match with it. Um, LSU is a, a, a modern football team, and I mean that, that their pass defense will be built to stop the pass. Uh, that's at least what I'm expecting. I think they're going to run mostly 4-2-5, a little bit of 4-3, um, and the strength of this team will be DBs with pass rushing defensive line. I don't think they're going to be a, a great run-stopping team. Uh, I could be wrong, but they are breaking in a lot of new linebackers, including you know Clemson transfer Mike Jones, who should be a good player, and um, uh, some serviceable. I mean, they have a lot of depth in that front seven. I don't see them being the front seven that's just dominating the line of scrimmage and stopping teams from running the ball, period. Uh, I I did get to watch highlights. Unfortunately, we were preparing for the storm last week, so I did not get to watch the entire game. But I I saw the running back, Charbonnet, was incredible, 17 and a half yards per carry. (laughs) He is a little bowling ball. That's the kind of physical back that I would expect to be able to have some success. And then, of course, Dorian Thompson-Robinson, I think – uh, if I'm not mistaken, he he, he was pro- uh, top like number two quarterback in the country uh, mm-hmm. four years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And a lot of people were expecting big things with him and Chip Kelly put together. Of course, they've only won, I think, 12 games since Chip Kelly took over. Uh, and people are expecting him to kind of take that next step. And he was serviceable last year, serviceable uh, in the game against um, Hawaii. But it seems more than anything, he, you know, spreads the field out with his legs. It really just opens up, even if he's only taken a handful of carries. It's just that that the possibility he can do that. So I expect UCLA to be able to have some success, uh, you know, full transparency. You look at the recruiting rankings uh, of these teams and just the sheer star caliber talent. And you would think LSU has a substantial uh, advantage in that department. Um, However, uh, I I do think the matchup keeps it, keeps it a respectable game for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. And maybe that's not, I'm not trying to be a homer there, but I think this will be a good one. Uh, And I think it's just because as you kind of talked to, there is a lot of unknown with LSU after last year and, in the turnover of that, whereas UCLA, like we know they're going to be better than last year because they literally returned everybody yeah. but two starters and the maturity of these players. And the thing no one's really talking about is this offensive line, which is probably the best in the Pac-12, uh, returning all five starters and you have some potential, you know, draft picks at the tackle positions. Uh, so it'll be a fun one to watch. I got two more for you, Preston, and then I'll get you out of here. You know, we talked the, the offense versus defense matchup. 
you mentioned the quarterback. You mentioned the you know the elite receiver that's going to be great for this LSU Tigers team. This UCLA defense has had their struggles in the past, especially with Chip Kelly when he took over, and they have not been a good defense. Last week looked very, very different. Again, you know, lesser competition, but the defense was flying around the ball. Tackling, which has been their biggest issue, looked great last week. They forced many turnovers. Uh, they were just a different look defense. How do you like the matchup of the offense versus the defense? And what do you think this LSU offense can be? What's their like peak this year? I don't think it's 2019 offense, but what's their kind of peak this year, you think, for this LSU offense? Yeah, and I, I definitely like the matchup UCLA's offense has against uh, uh, LSU much more than the other side of the ball in terms of from the UCLA perspective. Mm-hmm. I think I think defensively, I would expect UCLA just to have a few more problems because, you, you, again, you mentioned the turnovers. Uh, you look at LSU during Max Johnson's uh, tenure last year, he did not turn the ball over. He did not make any bonehead plays. And the running backs showed a high level of ball security. I would not expect to force a lot of turnovers on this offense. And, uh, you know, I, I think that to cover just the sheer volume of athletes this team's going to have, especially passing the ball, um, I, I think that I think that you're, you're going to have to have a lot of Jimmys and Joes ready to to cover some guys because, I mean, they, they the depth at wide receiver, of course, you know, you've got Kashan Butte, who's going to be your certified superstar. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's just a ton of just great players uh, on, you know, they, they guys like Jare Jenkins who have been there for a while and looking for a starting role. He had 12 catches in the spring game. I mean, just, all, all, you know, highly recruited guys who have been waiting their turn to get in behind all these first and second round receivers LSU's had a couple of years uh you I would be shocked if LSU does not move the ball I would not be shocked if UCLA scores some points on this defense I, I would be shocked if if L, LSU doesn't also score some points too I, I am not expecting <laughs> an old 9-6 <laughs> brawl on Saturday by any means I wouldn't either. Not, not, at least with UCLA, that's been, not been their MO. Even though they haven't had a good record, they do put up points, but they do give up points. So <laughs> I think we can expect that at the Rose Bowl on Saturday. Uh, last thing for you, one of the always storylines with these Pac-12 SEC matchup is the travel, obviously. Uh, you know, a few years ago, Oregon going down to Auburn in a nail-biter. Cal going to Ole Miss and squeaking out a win there. Um, this is a very different situation because of the hurricane going on. And, and I don't mean to put you on the spot because I don't know how much you know about the situation, but has the team, you know, already flown to LA? Are they practicing elsewhere? Are they still, you know, at headquarters in Baton Rouge? How much does that you think play a factor into them coming out here in just, you know, almost what, 48 hours from now and playing a football game? Very good question. Um, so LSU, uh, took their team to Texas this mm-hmm. last week. They practiced at uh, Houston's facility uh, there, and that's a very familiar area for LSU. Houston, mm-hmm. not very far away. Um, I, 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 and they are now in Pasadena right now. Okay. So I, I don't necessarily think this will affect their performance too, too much. I mean, obviously a lot of players distracted. There's a lot of players from – you know, this area impacted by the storm, particularly, you know, the Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and, and North Shore. It's a lot of players who come from that area. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you, you you know, they might have a bit of a distraction, but, I mean, getting away from all this mess in Baton Rouge can only be a good thing for them. I, I don't think it's going to be too much of a uncomfortable environment, too different from, I mean, we were talking about a team going – to play their first game on the West Coast, uh, thousands of miles away, it was going to be a different environment. I wouldn't expect it to truly impact the team more so than you would see during like a regular, you know, cross country matchup like mm-hmm. this. Yeah, yeah. It'll, I mean, you know, glad they're able to get out of there and good here in uh, Pasadena and safe and stuff. So uh, certainly should be a good game. Can't wait. I will be there. Uh, looking forward to it and always a good matchup playing against the SEC. So Preston guy, really appreciate you coming on. He's the LSU Tigers beat writer for tigerbait.com. Uh, thanks for the insight, man. It's great getting to know you and, and meet you. And I really uh, am praying for everyone down there and hope you uh, stay safe and continue to, you know, heal and rebuild down there, man. Thank you, Ryan. Looking forward to the game on Saturday.
All right, big game. Let's see how it goes. Let me know, guys. Hit me up on Twitter, at Ryan Dyer, at LAFB. You can hit up the main account, at LAFB Network. You can find that everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, as I mentioned, YouTube channels, at LAFB Network. Thank you, though, for tuning in. Another great hour of LA football talk. Um, let me know what you guys want. If you, there's any specific guests you want, any specific direction you want me to go with this, I'm having a ton of fun, having a blast. We've had some awesome, you know, comments and mentions, uh, not just YouTube, but you know, people hit me up in the DMs, and uh, it's been a blast. So I want to get to know everyone better. We have a great reach now with this radio signal, which has always been a dream of mine. Uh, but I want to hear your thoughts, how we can improve the show, because I do this for you guys. It's a blessing for me. But I hope it's enjoyable for you as you sit on your Friday commute every Friday at five. Um, but yeah, let's keep this rolling, keep this rocking. Uh, USC and UCLA plays tomorrow. And then finally, next week, the NFL returns. We'll do a lot of NFL stuff next week as the Rams host the Bears on Sunday night football. Chargers travel to Washington to play the football teams. We'll have plenty of stuff going there. Enjoy the week, guys. Enjoy the weekend. Peace.